naughty or nice? Which one? Naughty. Oops. It's already cooked. I just don't know what to do with the rest of it. Gail, you want to give her a hand with that? Okay. I get the other. Oh, oh, oh. Thank you. I think I'm wired. Hello? Can you hear me? No, not, not any more than if you didn't. Hello? 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 There. Hello? That's better. Yeah. Oh, okay. There it is. <coughs> yeah, you want me amplified, eh? <laughs> You're always in. Excuse me? I've heard that. <laughs> so I'd like to welcome you to the Nelson Unitarian Spiritual Center. And I think almost all of you have been here before. Maybe not. You guys been, you, have you been here before? Okay. Uh, well, uh, welcome to all of you. I, this is actually a, a delightful surprise. <laughs> I have so many people on Christmas Eve. So thank you for coming. Um, we would like to start with a song, and most of you have a song book or are close to one. There's either a hardcover or or one of the soft cover ones. And the, the song we're going to sing is Spirit of Life, and it's 123 in the hard book, but it's also numbered 123, but there aren't 123 songs in there. <laughs> so it's kind of in the middle. Kind of in the middle. So it's Spirit of Life. And John's going to play... Play it through once. John's going to play the tune through once so that you can hear it. <laughs> expressed. So 
If you would like to take this candle and light one of the small ones, tell us your name first, and uh, then what your joy or concern is. So, there you go, Marcia. Thank you very much. Try to hold the candle over the table. Thank you. So the wax doesn't go on the floor. We have been uh, chastised. <laughs> Um, I, I would like to light this candle for two joys. One is the joy of our brand new bed that, <laughs> that we actually drove all the way to Spokane to a mattress factory and had it made just for us. And while we were in Spokane, we had the great joy of attending the solstice uh, choir and ritual at the Unitarian Church of Spokane that was incredibly enriching and heartfelt and joyous and sad in the darkness and joy in the light. And so for solstice, as we begin to find shorter nights and a bit longer days, oh, <laughs> full of joy. <laughs> full of joy. Someone else come and share their joys and concerns. I thought maybe you thought it was a menorah. Yeah, exactly. Monica, <laughs> Monica. Hi, Dan. Um, I'd like to light a candle <clears throat> for. Uh, I won't light two candles in case we run out of the <laughs> One candle for our two speakers today. Wow. Ali and John, thank you. Thank you for coming and speaking today. Um, Hi, my name is Jane, and I would like this candle not just for joy and sorrow. Joy in that, or sorrow, I guess, in that um, none of our family is here, but joy in that we have found way more new family. Uh, with all the people that we will be seeing over these holidays. And so, um, both joy and sorrow at the same time. You've inspired me, Jamie. My name's Keith, and I, I'm, I'm in the same boat. My name is far and spread, and uh, only uh, three of us are going to be here. Um, but this is a joy for the wonder of modern technology, because I'm going to see them all over the next couple of days on the computer with um, with FaceTime and Skype. So, and tonight, this afternoon, we're playing, all my kids and I are playing Dungeons and Dragons. <laughs> <laughs> For right. Christmas Eve, so that's a, that's a delight. Mm -hmm. My name's Katharina. Um, I also share the joy and not joy, the not joy that my family is, oh no, I cry, my family is not here. Oof. And uh, the joy for the Hanukkah celebrations that I really, really enjoyed. There you go. I'm Ricky, thank you. <laughs> uh, my name is Jean, and like many people, I share the sorrow of um, family members not being present, uh, in physical presence, but certainly present in heart. But I would also like to share the joy of being reintroduced to this wonderful spiritual community that I knew some years ago, and through my dear friend Lee, discovered was um, having this wonderful uh, celebration and presentation today. So I feel very much filled with joy for the pleasure and being here. Thank you. <clears throat> and I'd like to light. <clears throat> well, there are two candles left. Does anybody else want to light one? You should have two lights. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure I shouldn't. <laughs> Dangerous enough of one. <laughs> but does anyone else have a burning need to light a candle? All right, go ahead. Oh, you go first. No, no. She, no, no, she, I'm going to do it because I'm, I'm going to lighting the last one. Oh, I, I thought there was only one left. <clears throat> Thank you. Keep her at bay. Oh, it's on. 
Thank you, Dale. Try that again. I'm Elizabeth. <laughs> and I'm very happy to be here. And uh, I'm lighting the candle for the joy of having children in our lives. We have two grandchildren here, and they bring such hope and delight <coughs> to our lives, but also, I think, to the community they're part of. So for the, the children in our lives. You want to do it? I'll let John do it. It's too much of a challenge. Thank you. And I like this last candle for all the joys and concerns that uh, haven't come to breath yet, but are buried in our hearts. And we can continue this wonderful tradition. <coughs> One of these has different words, and um, you can look at those words. <laughs> you can look at them anytime, but if you look at them now, um, or if you don't have the program, you can look at someone else's words. Uh, and and um, what I would like you to do is think about. Um, some of, the, some of these words were, uh, <clears throat> there goes the divine feminine, I didn't even say so. <laughs> uh, um, but some people have two, some people have three of the words. And uh, these I wrote down as qualities of divine feminine, and I just want to say that divine feminine is not gender. It is the quality and the essence of, of many of these words, and, and it is embodied by um, some, you know, some other entities, you know, whether they're religious entities or whether it's, it's Gaia, the earth, Mother Earth. So at this moment, you can look at some of the words if you want, you can look within yourself and see where within me do I have a divine feminine. And I want you to just sit and think about that for the next moment. Divine feminine, who are you? I'd like you to come back to the room, and then later we're going to share some of our thoughts. But you may have heard that occasionally I tell stories. <laughs> I don't know if that's good or bad. <clears throat> but if you'd like, uh, both John and I are going to share a story with you, and John's going to begin. Well, this is the time uh, that we celebrate in many places and traditions the uh, birth of Jesus. Um, the Quran has uh, a similar uh, sort of tale of the birth of Jesus, uh, although it's not the same as the manger and the Joseph and those folks. Uh, and uh, it's an alternative 
uh, telling, and I thought it might be interesting to hear how that is, is done. So we start with the phrase, Bismillah Arakman Arakim, which means we begin in the name of Allah, who is mercy and compassionate. This comes from Surah 19, called Miriam, uh, the, the word for, for the Mother Mary. And she does go uh, and uh, is visited by the, the uh, angel Gabriel, and uh, she says, how can I be uh, pregnant when I have not been with a man? And the word from Gabriel is kumanakum, be and it is. So that's it. <laughs> that's that's uh, that's the power of Allah. Uh, she says, uh, and and when her family found out that she was pregnant without a husband, why she was shunned uh, by the family, and it, it's, the reading is, um, uh, it says, and the Lord says. It is, oh, it's easy to make life, and I can take it from him. So she conceived him, and then withdrew herself to a place, uh, to uh, re uh, herself with him, the, the babe, to a remote place. And that's, that's, that's interesting, and I'll talk a little bit about that later. And in the throes of childbirth, compelled her to uh, um, betake herself to this trunk of a palm tree. She said, oh, would that I have died before this and had been a thing quite forgotten. So uh, childbirth wasn't always easy, even in those days, obviously. Uh, then the child called out to her from beneath her. He says, grieve not. Surely your Lord has made a stream to flow beneath you. So she put her hand down and found water. And then as she was in the throes of pain, she grabbed the palm tree and the palm dates fall, fell upon her. She uh, then took the babe back to her family and they said, what is this? Oh, get out of here and so forth. And then the baby Jesus spoke to them uh, with these words. Uh, he said, uh, uh, and um, and he may oh there it's like and he has made me blessed wherever I may be and he is enjoined on my prayer and post rate so long as I live and dutiful to my mother he has made me uh, and, and not insolent and not unblessed and peace on me on the day I was born and on the day I die and in the day I'm raised to life. Such is Isa, son of Miriam. Uh, so we have a talking child right away, which is uh, an interesting uh, commentary. Um, and the interesting thing is uh, there was an article in the New York Times called Away in a Manger or Under a Palm Tree. And uh, it's interesting that, that um, the Chronicles of James, which didn't make it into the New Testament, uh, talks about uh, that uh, Mary was actually on her way from uh, Bethlehem to, or from Jerusalem to Bethlehem, and she stopped halfway and went into a cave, and there conceived the baby, uh, while Joseph ran out for a midwife. Uh, what's that? that conceived it, delivered it. Delivered it, yeah, delivered it with the, with the midwife, yeah, called the midwife. Right? Um, and it's said that in the, in the Gospel of James that it is somewhere in the desert between Bethlehem and Jerusalem. Well, in 1997, archaeologists found a small chapel that was on the road that they found, and they found there a cave, and they found out that there was a stream flowing through the cave. And uh, when they... they uh, did more archaeology, they found out that there was actually pictures of palm trees around the stream. So, uh, who knows? <laughs> 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 Thought that was an interesting update.
Now, isn't Miriam the only one, woman named? She's the only named, and she's named more in the Quran than she is in the in the, in the New in, Testament. In the, okay, yeah. in the Christian. Yeah. So it's an al alternative to see this. Thing. So the divine feminine arises everywhere, <laughs> and especially within us, and. Um, what the story I would like to tell you is the story about uh, the Virgin of Guadalupe. And uh, she, I don't know how many of you are aware, but she is honored primarily in Mexico City. And uh, this was in, let's see if I remember the date, uh, 14, 1460. Well, 1463. 1463. No, well, whatever. 14. It was almost 500 years ago, and um, that's when this story starts. And there was a young man. His name was Juan Diego, and Juan Diego was, you know, on his way, and and all of a sudden he was walking past to Payac Hill. It's a hill. Uh, with an Aztec name, a Tepeyac. And this happened at a time that was not too long after the conquest of the Aztec. And um, he was walking and walking, and he, all of a sudden he heard all these birds singing. Many, many, many birds. And he was like, wow, what, what is that? And so he started walking up the hill. And then he heard a voice, and the voice said, Juan, Juan Diego, Juanito, my littlest one, how are you? And he looked, and there was this beautiful woman. And her gown, that she, her dress she was wearing, was all covered in stars. And the ground beneath her just glowed. And the mesquite bush and the cactus sparkled. And she said, Juanito, my littlest one, how are you? And he was just in awe, and he went down on his knees. And she said, Juanito, I have a message I want you to take to the bishop in Mexico City. And she said, on this hill, I want you to build my temple. And from this temple, when people come, I will, I will give healing and love to everyone who comes. But it is here that I want this temple built. And he, he goes, oh yes, of course, and he goes running off to the bishop. And he goes in there and they, they kind of sort of let him, and he's a peasant, you know, he's not dressed too nicely, he's dressed peasantly. <laughs> and, uh, and they say, yes, yes, what, is, what do you want? And he said, I just, I was on this hill, I was on Tepeyac Hill, I saw this woman, and she spoke to me. Everything was glowing, and there were stars, and she wants you to build a temple on that hill. Well, that's a, that's a very interesting story. <laughs> hmm, let me think about that. Uh, come back some other day. And he knew that he wasn't believed, and he went right back to Tepeyac Hill, and, and, and he said, Mother, Mother, they won't believe me. And she said, you need to tell them. He said, no, no, no. He said, I'm, I'm a peasant. I mean, look at me. He said, I can't. I can't. They're not going to listen to me. They're not going to respect me. Will you send someone who's important? Send someone who's, who, who knows more. I, I know nothing. She said, you are the one for my message. I want you to tell him that I want my, my temple built here. And so he went back, and he told him again. And he said, and the bishop said, well, OK, OK, if, if that's the case, and if this is the truth, I want you to bring back some proof. Proof. OK. OK, so off he wanders. And then he said, all right, you two guys, I want you to follow him and find out what's going on. And so it was early in the morning, still a little dark. And they, they lost him. And they didn't want to admit their mistakes, so they came back and they said, "He's lying. He's lying. He's not. You know, he doesn't do anything." You know, 
Yeah, I thought so. You know, so. Meanwhile, he goes, he goes up to the hill, but he, he had to stop at home first. And there, his uncle was in bed, and he was dying. He thought, oh, I can't go back to that hill. I've got to go dashing off and get a priest. You know, he's going to die. So he, he starts running to get, to get a priest, and, and it's, he hears a voice, Juanito, Juanito, as he's running past the hill, and he goes like, I didn't think she'd see me. And he said, Juanito, come, come, no, come on, come in. Well, I know him. <laughs> come on in, Juanito. His name is John, so Juanito. <clears throat> anyway, um, so I went, he said, come, come up here. He says, well, I can't. You know, my uncle is sick. I need to give him a priest. I'll come back tomorrow. She says, no, no, no. Have you, don't be afraid. Don't you know that I am your mother? I, I have your best interest in my heart. And as we speak, your uncle is a well right now. And she says, come up here, and I have things for you to do. She said, you see all of these flowers? And as he got up on the hill, he smelled the flowers. Oh, it was glorious. And she said, pick them. Put them in your cloak and take them to the bishop. This is your proof. And so he got up there and he, he took all these oh, glorious flowers. And he had never seen this kind of flower before. And it was December. What are they blooming all over the place in December for? Holy cow. And he gets all the flowers and he goes dashing off to the bishop's palace. Well, the servants there, don't let him in. And he's crying, oh man, he waits moments, hours. And 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 he keeps, you know, asking to be let in. No, no, no. No, no, you can't come in. But but I have this for the bishop. It's and then and then he peeled a little corner of his cloak and they saw these amazing flowers and they went to try and grab it. And the minute they grabbed it, they disappeared. And all was left in there was kind of a picture. And then they'd back off. They'd try it again. Three times they tried. Couldn't do it. So they finally said, OK, OK, come on in. Come to the bishop. So and, and she had told him, the mother had told him when you get in, open your cloak and let the flowers fall and see what happens. And so he goes in. And he lets his cloak down, and these flowers fall all over the floor. The smell is exquisite. And the bishop is shocked because these are the very same flowers. These are the roses that grew in Seville when he was a boy. He knows these flowers, and he knows they don't grow here. And then when they looked at the cloak that he was wearing, there was this image of a beautiful woman in a star-colored covered dress. And they were amazed. And so were the servants that were there, just amazed. And when they finally went and agreed to go with him, they said, come, 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 come to the hill. And he took them to the hill, and he said, this, this is where she wants her temple built. He said, OK. And then they went to his house. <coughs> And there was the uncle, well, walking around, feeling wonderful. He said, he said, not that long ago, I had a woman, vision, come to me. She said her name was Mary, Mary of Guadalupe. And, and so they, everyone believed them, and they built the temple. And when it was built, they took, they took, was they, they took Juan Diego's cloak with the picture of Mary of Guadalupe, and they hung it up over the altar. And it hangs there until this day. And the colors are as bright as they were on the day when they first hung it up. And millions of people come to visit this pilgrimage site. Three million people visited last year. It is the most visited pilgrimage site in the world. 
So there is our Blessed Mother <laughs> showing up for us. Oh, and thank you, John. <coughs> um, the Tepehak Hill is was originally where Tonatzin, the Maya, the the Aztec goddess, that was her hill. So many, many people combine the two: Tonatzin, the Maya, the Aztec goddess, and Mary. So, so so a lot of people celebrate when they come. They see Tonatzin, and other people come and see Mary, and other people just see the Divine Mother. So. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Is that a true story? Is that a good story? Yeah. True story. Yeah, it's a true, it's a true story. It's a true story. You can go to Mexico City. I wondered when I was in Mexico what the significance was of Guadalupe. Oh, yeah, she's big. Well, and I have, I have my Guadalupe earrings on. <laughs> <laughs> so. Um, so now, uh, one of the things that you received was little little words, and you had a moment ago to reflect. And um, what I would like you to do is, if you have a thought, a feeling, a reflection of divine femininity, whatever that might be, if you would. If you, if you have any thoughts that you want to share or would like to hear them now, um, and, and, or, or we can do, um, we do an exchange for this week. Yeah, okay. And um, so, any thoughts on either your words or the Divine Feminine? And if not, I have another. <laughs> Thanks, Mom. <laughs> that was the Divine Mother speaking. Thank you very much. Um, well, when I look at these words uh, in, uh, in relation to myself, um, I felt that. Uh, Can you tell us what the words are? Because they're, they're different for everyone. So tell us what the words are. Okay, well, grace is the word that I related to. And. Um, <laughs> it's going to sound ridiculous, but I feel I'm quite graceful. And I don't have much more to say. That's great. <laughs> But I see myself um, move through the day and the months and the years and my life, and I feel it's grace. grace. Mm -hmm. in it, but it did remind me of the solstice event that I went to in Spokane. Since I got the card, the name remembering, and this has been such a year of inviting people's memories about what's precious in their aging and what the challenges are and writing about that. Um, and in terms of the Divine Feminine, thank you for that lovely story. My name is Lee, by the way. I, I've. For me, Christmas is a time to be actually deeply peaceful. Um, 
and that's been a priority. There, um, and I've probably attended a good dozen concerts because music means a lot to me uh, over Christmas. Uh, it's a time to recapitulate and remember the year and, and bring it together. I, I, in many ways, I find the darkness sad, but reflective and lovely. Recently, over this year, I've noticed a different sense of light. I wouldn't call it grace. Uh, I don't see myself moving through my days particularly gracefully. So, um, most of you for having that. But it is a feeling of, um, as I look back on the year, I realize how much everything I have um, risked, how much I felt supported in almost every aspect of my life, and how little I've trusted that. And so the inner feeling is a sense of um, uh, a quiet light. And I want to preface that by saying that throughout my life I've been a horrible meditator. I'm not good at quietening my mind. It's a very busy, noisy mind, a bit like that Christmas tree we just unplugged, which was squeaking like a mouse <laughs> when you all first came in. Um, with this sense of lightness in myself, not necessarily joyful, but it's a quiet, peaceful place, I equate that, I think of that as part of the Divine Feminine. I think, um, I was trying to explain to my daughter who's 31 and has just come up for Christmas, what it's like to grow that. And I think for many people in aging, when I look back at my younger years, there would be mystical experiences that I would fall into or open to, and I go feel amazed, and then forget about that with the busyness of life, of raising children, of baking a living, of having a career, and of my striving mind. And, um, and then with mid-years, would resort more to those times of mystical, you could call them meditation experiences, um, if you're, more, you're better at that than I am, which I guarantee most of you are, um, would use them to alleviate stress, kind of a visiting relationship, I'll go to this quiet place, won't stay long, and then come back, hopefully renewed, so I can achieve something else. So it's interesting with aging to experience that place growing and becoming a priority, almost as though it takes over one's identity. And then the other stuff is important, but it recedes more to the side. So whatever that sense of light or divine feminine, which I see as becoming a whole heart, is, um, I'm really appreciating that as a part of aging. And I hope as I also move more towards the dying stage of my life, that that spaciousness can grow and support me through that. So there's a long-winded version of, um, of um, waiting for should it come back? <laughs> thank you, Lee. And thank you for your wisdom. Uh, I'm Marcia. And uh, there was a part of the solstice ceremony ritual where they gave, <clears throat> they gave out candles. Um, and they were on your seat when you sat down. And you were to put the candle <clears throat> in your hand. And there was a part in the service where they asked people to think about and meditate upon <clears throat> what is the light that they bring to the world. And it's not something that we often think about. It's not something that we give ourselves permission to think about. Um, in many times you would think that it, you, you, you're boasting or you're uh, <clears throat> some other word that reduces your sense of the light that you bring into the world. And this was an opportunity for people to spend that time um, going inside and thinking about the light. And <clears throat> 
and not to hide that light, but to really bring it out into your into your consciousness for the time. <clears throat> and I kept thinking when I was doing that that I I have a gift and I don't know where it comes from and I don't know um, if I if I have a right to it, but I do see the the result of it in my conversations with many people. And and that light um, from that comes from inside of me seems to give others the opportunity to come forward and engage with me about what's in their own hearts. And so I guess that's a gift of the divine feminine. My name is Michael. And the word beauty appears in my program. When I dwelt on beauty, um, an endless stream of meanings occurred to me. And I thought beauty is a is a word that um, relates so much to the theme that we're talking about today. Uh, and um, I thought of all the different meanings of beauty and thought if one reflects on beauty, how it can change our, our outlook on so many different things. Um, we, we go about our life, our ordinary life, and we um, come across so many um, times when we have uh, feelings other than um, the right ones. We feel aggressive, or we feel bad, or we feel sad. And I'm thinking that if you reflect on the word beauty, you can see beauty in anything that you that you come that your eyes come reflect on. Um, you go out for a walk and you see the surroundings, you see the geography, you see the pictures in front of you, or you see the, the dog that is that you're walking with or the person that you're with. And um, I just wanted to relate that if one, <coughs> if one reflects on that word rather than a negative, how it can change your, your feeling. My name is Jack, um, and the word that went shining into my <coughs> soul as I looked at it was birthing. And <coughs> was what? Uh, birthing. Birth? And <coughs> my brother and I grew up in a family in Montreal uh, of extreme loving kindness <coughs> run by our matriarch was my grandmother, our grandmother, <clears throat> was incredibly powerful, loving, caring, and humorous woman, very irreverent, <clears throat> and challenged everything around us. And um, really pushed the idea that it's man that is ruining our planet, because man has never given birth, and that a woman who has given birth and has known the beauty and the miracle of childbearing and suckling and providing sustenance has a completely different feeling about life 
and the value of life. And um, throughout my life, that has been a truism for me. And the hope that women will become more and more powerful in leading the world into a better world because of their value for life. Coupled with the shame of being a man and having men thoughts, which are completely the opposite, but part of my meme. Um, so I just want to say that I honor women. I honor my feminine, my femininity, which has become more and more outward as I came to uh, Nelson in the past year and a half <laughs> and met wonderful men who are like me. Thank you. So two of the words that spoke to me um, that represent and encapsulate um, some of the many, many qualities of the Divine Feminine are compassion and mercy. Um, I want to express and experience and um, live my life as compassionately as possible. Compassion with passion. Um, to show mercy in the way that I would love to receive um, kindness and mercy in my own life. And the third word is community. Uh, so I want to express these qualities in my own personal community and uh, a deep, deep um, concern and hope that these qualities can be expressed more often, more frequently, more lovingly in world community. I have deep concern about our world community, as I'm sure other people do on occasion. And um, I just feel so strongly that if I can demonstrate compassion and mercy, invite those qualities into my own life, and hopefully shine those out so that in some form, in some way, I can contribute um, to the increase of compassion and mercy in other people's communities and other people's lives. Well, I, I just wanted to say about the, the little uh, letters that you got. I think there are some people who didn't get any. And uh, one of the things I wanted us to do was to to share them. In other words, or if someone uh, you know didn't get one, you could, which Jane already she already you know way ahead of us here. She just defined feminine right up there. And <laughs> but it's the. Uh, part of the qualities, of course, is, is sharing and caring. And also, um, I think one of the things is that an individuality, and I think the story showed to me that individuality. Jose, I mean, Juan, Juan, Juanito, little Juanito, you know, you're so precious. You as an individual, and you're the one that's going to take the message. You're the one that's important. And it's so, so that no one is um, marginalized. So uh, the feminine, I think, looks at, like when you have a baby, that's your focus. You, you're on, you focus on one individual, not even yourself, it's the baby. And, <clears throat> and so, and by that, it, when, when you grow up in, in a loving, caring um, place, or, or you create that for yourself, you, you start, that starts spreading out in the whole world. It starts spreading out in your family. It starts spreading out in your um, neighborhood. Or if it doesn't spread out in, in the family, you go like, oh, well, this seed isn't going to grow here. We're going to take it over here. And now I have, I have a family of choice in where it is growing, where it's beautiful. So beauty and um, remembering, we need to remember who we are. We need to remember our own divine feminine. And if you guys have little extra tickets, share them with someone else or whatever you'd like to do. Just express your divine feminine however you would like to do it. Um, and now we would like to uh, pay the rent. 
<laughs> practical things because practicality is another divine feminine attribute. Yeah. Okay. And uh, and the, in, in your in your program, because you have one, there is just a. Uh, we're going to sing We Are Saying Thank You. Very, very simple song as we... Because the words we, are, we are saying thank you. We are saying thank you. We are saying thank you. Thank you for our presence. No, thank you is our practice. No, let's do it this way. Right. Well, that's version. why you changed it. Christmas version. Thank you for our presence. Thank you for our presence. However you want to spell that word. <laughs> oh, oh, okay, all right, that's great. I forgot. Okay. I forgot. <laughs> so if you would like to stand, we'll sing that. Short song? Uh, stand if you're willing and able. We are saying thank you. We are saying thank you. We are saying thank you. Thank, thank you for our presence. <laughs> we are saying thank you. We are saying thank you. Thank you, thank you for our presence. And, and, uh, all right, go ahead. And, uh, thank you. You can you can sit if you like. I would like to thank Jack for. Um, voicing uh, the male perspective, his male perspective, um, which is an expression of the divine feminine. Um, and, and I would like to say um, that, it, that it's hard to carry shame <coughs> And it hurts to carry shame. And so by your expressing everything you express today, that is how men can remove the shame from their lives. And I thank you for it. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Season of light. As Marcia reminds us of the solstice, uh, one of the beautiful solstice celebrations that we used to attend was in the dark night, all the lights would go out and we'd be sitting in darkness and coming through the door would be a young 12-year-old girl with a headdress of lighted candles, mm -hmm. Santa 